Hi, in this video, I'm going to give a summary of chapter 9 about convolutional networks uh, of the deep learning book from my Angle Fellow and Company. Uh, convolutional networks are important for uh, applications like computer vision, detecting objects, things like that. Uh, in, in general, uh, they are good for uh, problems with data that is a large and continuous grid-like grid -like data. Uh, for example, matrices in images, tensors, uh, for example, in CT scans, MRIs, uh, images. And the, this book is focused uh, on theory. Uh, you mostly, at most, as you're going to see a lot of mathematical formulas, a uh, uh, pseudocode as well, but uh, you rarely, if ever, going to see a reference to explicit API like Keras or a MATLAB deep learning toolbox, probably that, that is on purpose. Uh, for that, uh, there's a few references uh, for uh, both MATLAB uh, Deep Learning Toolbox and Keras. Uh, I recommend uh, learning both the practical side along with the theoretical side. The theoretical side uh, gives you the background that the other references do not give and vice versa. Uh, is, they are complementary. Convolutional networks are also known as Convolutional Neural Networks or CNN for its abbreviation. Uh, for the name CNN, you might think that it is a biased network, but uh, it is not necessarily has to be. It, it, the network uh, has biases, has bias, but it's not necessarily biased. Okay, uh, so as mentioned before, it is good for grid-like uh, arrays, uh, continuous uh, arrays like image data, matrices. Uh, if you have a color matrix and you have the color channel, it could be hyper a spectral channel uh, that would be the third dimension and if you add the uh, and it is a video of those images then you have a fourth dimension and also can be volumetric data like CT scans, MRIs and other type of similar data. Uh, convolution is a special kind of linear operation that should make it easy for backpropagation and uh, the gradient descent uh, optimization training algorithm. And uh, I am good fellow mentioned that a, a convolution network can be seen as a, taking a classical network that uses a GMM, generic a matrix multiplication, and replacing those layers by convolutional layers. And you can see the difference in here. Uh, this is a GMM in which all nodes depends on all the nodes of the previous layers, and all nodes in the previous layer feel, feed all the ne uh, nodes in the next layer. So it's basically everything with everything, and each connection has a different uh, weight value. In the case of convolution, uh, you have less connections. It only is like a local connection. Uh, and you will see later that this uh, implements the neighbor processing pattern, the extensive pattern. Uh, you have fewer connections, and the connections are shared. And you can imagine that uh, the number of computations are way more less, the number of memory is way more less. You have to train A and B only, rather than having to train all those parameters. So it generalizes better, and when when it applies, it, it works uh, more efficiently and better. But uh, it doesn't apply for everything. This is the mathematical uh, representation of the convolution operation, and the, which represents an integral that uh, multiplies a couple of functions. In this case, x corresponds to the input and w to the kernel, the weights of the convolution, the weights of the neural network that are going to be trained. So you can see, uh, usually in convolution, uh, you transform an input image to another output image. Uh, for in convolution, you're going to see that the first layers uh, represent image processing like uh, operations, like morphology operation, delayed erode, uh, edge detection, which can, uh, can transform the image to res uh, highlight some, some of the features. So so that's what, what you're going to expect here. This is an input image, output image. So uh, the weights uh, is the, is, are used to transform the image. And you can see the weights at the, as the map between the input and the output. Notice that the input is in the A domain and T is and W is in the T domain. So which correspond to the same domain as the output. So you can see the link that W serves as a bridge between the input and the output. So you can. Uh, this is similar, uh, so you're changing from the domain A to the domain T in this operation, similar to what happens in the Fourier transform and Laplace transform that you're changing from the time domain to the frequency domain. 
another way of seeing this is like a, a multiply, multiplying all the values of one, form, uh, one formula x with all the values of w, like doing an exhaustive search. And also it can be seen as in the Fourier transform that you're trying to find the, the most resonant components. For example, in, in Fourier, you're trying to find the sine and cosine factors that uh, resonate more with the input. And yeah, uh, this is only one dimension. Uh, also, integrals uh, are, you cannot compute integrals in computers, so you have to approximate them with a summation and uh, with cor which correspond to a for loop in programming language and it's rare that if this is one dimension so we shall in convolution we see two or more dimensions so it will be one summation over the other which in programming language would be nested for loops and also the the kernel the weight is usually small compared to the size of the input and output images and uh, also memory is limited so if you want to stick to the mathematical formula uh, then you can assume that these uh, functions are zero uh, when the memory is not defined okay so here we have uh, the 2d version of the convolution but still there's a problem uh, the, as mentioned before the input and output images are of the same size most of the time so they should be in the same domain in here they are not in the same domain so a uh, convolution is commutative so we can flip the order and now we have a image in the i j domain as the output and but and then we have k the kernel weight in the m n domain which should be way smaller than the i j domain uh, and you can see that the convolution goes in the reverse order in here and iterates through the values of m and n in this which can be seen as a reduction operation in this domain. So the reduction is done in here and at the end you get a, a pixel value in ij to get the output. Uh, this is this is implemented uh, perfectly by the GPU coder stencil kernel operation which you can see in the references uh, of this video and and also there's a concept in this type of uh, computations. Uh, you can see uh, the GPU coder stencil kernel operations is, uh, is like a, separa a dozen separation between schedule and algorithm. You can see this as the algorithm, and you can see this as the schedule. So this could go in any order. So uh, if you uh, by using the stencil kernel operation, you don't specify this. You leave it to the function to decide when to compute the values. And by doing that, and this operation can be parallelized uh, easily because it's up to the cogeneration for GPU coder or C++ cogeneration to uh, parallelize as much as, as possible. And this is, parallelization is very important for this type of problems because we receive a huge tensors, uh, for example, for medical analysis, a volumetric a CT scan, a MRI images. So parallelization is critical for these two work both in the usage of the network and the training, most importantly on the train, which can take hours or days. Okay, so this could be considered uh, the schedule. And this could, uh, is a reduction operator. And this pattern corresponds to, as mentioned before, the neighbor processing pattern, stencil pattern, and that's what the GPU coder stencil kernel uh, function uh, implements. Uh, you, you can notice that in convolution, uh, as mentioned before, uh, the order in the iterations in this reduction operation here uh, goes in reverse order than this uh, iteration. Uh, but there's a, a in practice we see the convolution operation actually in practice we see what is called the cross correlation operation which goes in the same direction like this the addition instead of a uh, subtraction but still uh, they call it a convolution even though it's really cross correlation okay here's an illustration of how the convolution uh, network work uh, visually and a uh, it's, it's basically implementing a neighbor processing pattern in which the windows is slided slide, uh, through the whole image. Uh, this is a hypothetical image. It's three rows by four columns. And uh, the output, I'm going to uh, explain in a moment later, uh, in a moment this, uh, is two rows by three columns because you lose the borders. You lose the borders because this window cannot go out of bounds. Uh, if you want the output image to be the same size of the input, which is pretty common, you, you can add zero values or repeat uh, the same last value in here or put uh, another value here. And then you have uh, expand the input image 
with padding, and then the output is going to be three by four, like the input. We're going to discuss more that in detail later. But for now, if you lose the border, eh, because of the size of the kernel, if the kernel is bigger, eh, let's say five by five, then you are going to lose more pixels from the input image. Okay, anyway, eh, this, this corresponds, uh, as mentioned before, to a neighbor processing pattern, a eh, stencil pattern, which you see a lot also in image processing. Eh, 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 functions and it's not a coincidence. I mean, you can see the convolution operation like a generic eh, image processing eh, operation eh, because eh, in classical eh, object detection using image processing, eh, usually you do some transformation like Gaussian filters eh, using the IM filter in in MATLAB tool, eh, image processing toolbox eh, using delayed road morphology operation from the same toolbox. Uh, and then uh, you uh, use edge detection and eventually you erode more, you fill holes and apply a threshold and then get the geometric properties and classify and detect your object. And uh, those first operations in that pipeline uh, are similar to what happens in a convolutional network. So the first layer in convolutional networks do similar things, transform the image, detect edges, and both of uh, those image processing for operations and convolution are very similar, are this uh, kind of a local transformation uh, from image to image. So you can see, yeah, again, the, the convolution as a generic uh, image processing uh, operation in which uh, instead of you designing the, the filter values, uh, the neural network designs the filters for you automatically. That's uh, the beauty of, of these convolutional networks. Okay, so let's uh, try it uh, for the first uh, pixel. So uh, this, uh, you can see that the, the operation is a reduction operation again. So you multiply element-wise the sum matrix here with this matrix, it's element-wise multiplication, and you add, add the elements, so you're gonna get a scalar in the output. So it's W by A, A W by A, B by X, E by Y, and C by F. And you add them together, and that corresponds to the pixel in here again, uh, this is a bad example because usually kernels are three, uh, three by three or an odd, uh, odd dimension so that you can pick up the center easily. Uh, but here, since it is even, then there's no center, so you have to pick so either this or something. We are picking this, so this will be the center of the, uh, and that will be the corresponding output. And then you slide the window and B by W, C by X, G by no, F by Y and G by C, and the last one, uh, then you pass this one, C by W, C by W, go down, E by W, and go here, F by W, and finally this one, G by W. Okay. So, yeah, uh, that's, that's how it works, and we are going to talk more about padding uh, later, so that, uh, because right now you've lost the edge in here, so... We're going to talk more about how to keep the image the same size later. Three key important ideas of convolutional uh, networks are sparse interactions, uh, parameter sharing, and equivalent representations. We're going to talk about the three of them. Uh, as mentioned before, classical networks use general, general matrix multiplication, which has full interaction between all uh, units. The first property is sparse interactions, that is a product of having a small kernel. Uh, basically, uh, this is having few connections, and as mentioned before, this re reduces the memory requirements, improves statistical uh, efficiency, and the uh, runtime computation is reduced. And it's also good uh, to detect, uh, for example, patterns. If you expect edges to be anywhere in the image, we're going to detect edges everywhere because the weight, small weight is trained to detect that. You can see here uh, again the, an illustration of the difference between general matrix multiplication layers, uh, which is called also fully connected layer, and the convolutional layer in which the output, the output uh, unit depends only on the neighbors. Uh, in here we have a stride of one, so we get the values in here, go for the next one, and then get all of here, and so on. But here is uh, all the, imp this one depends on all the inputs, and this one is feeding all the outputs. You can see the opposite in here. Uh, this one is feeding everything, and this one only is feeding, is feeding three. 
In here, this one depends on only three, and this one depends on everything. And you might think that uh, this has an advantage over this layer. Uh, well, if you have only one layer, uh, then of course uh, this is gonna have an advantage because this one, this one here is gonna know everything. So it's gonna be better trained than this one that only is seeing three values. But uh, we're talking about deep learning where there's a bunch of layers. So when you add more layers, uh, for example, only with two layers, <coughs> in this case, this one is gonna see all the input values. So it's gonna be affected by all the inputs. And if as you keep adding layers, then other uh, units are gonna uh, be able to be affected by all the inputs eventually. The second property is parameter sharing, uh, which is one of the main keys of convolutional networks. We have talked about this before. Uh, it's basically sharing the same weight matrix through all the convolution operations, unlike general matrix multiplication. And uh, again, it, it's more efficiency, both operational wise and uh, memory wise. The parameter sharing causes the property of a covariance in translation, which is important for detecting objects. If you want to detect a dog, you want to detect it everywhere in the image. If you want to detect edges, you want to detect everywhere in the images. So the, the operation is not affected by translation, and this equivalent translation can be seen as an order of operations do not matter, so you can apply the formula in any order. And here's an example of uh, comparing the convolution kernel versus the general matrix multiplication. Uh, you can see that uh, this, if this is the number of uh, operations in this case, you can pause to see more details. But the point is that uh, convolution is 60,000 more times faster than the general matrix multiplication. And this is why a convolution was Convolutional networks was of the first uh, deep learning networks that has success because of its efficiency. Uh, this uh, equi equivariant uh, property, uh, equivariant translation property, is good to detect patterns uh, like uh, edges, as mentioned before, uh, that could appear everywhere in the image. Uh, but there are cases where uh, you want to have some relative notion of the positions of the elements. For example, if you want to detect a face, you want to detect that the eyes are certain distance from the mouth or ears uh, to detect the pattern. Uh, maybe in, uh, in those cases you want to share parameters. I'm going to show some options about uh, not sharing always the parameters, uh, having like a middle ground between a convolution full parameter sharing and a one par a parameter value for each connection, like in general matrix multiplication. There's a in-between between those we're going to talk about in a moment. A convolution is a is translation equivalent, but it's not equivalent to other transformations, such as rotation of an image. For this one, you require other, other mechanism. I understand pooling is able to do that. We're going to talk more about that in a moment. And uh, for training uh, convolutional networks, it's important to provide uh, images that are uh, have fine transformations like rotation, translation, scaling, shearing, uh, which all of them can be represented in a single matrix. And uh, for example, the MATLAB deep learning toolbox has re re the data stores that provides the uh, augmentation automatically. Keras also have a uh, features to do the data augmentation uh, to provide those uh, affine transformations, uh, translation, rotation, shearing, uh, scaling, uh, automatically for the input data. Uh, that is important for a couple of reasons. Uh, first, uh, you, if you have limited data, it's gonna uh, uh, you can have uh, more data because you're rotating uh, your your data, you're transforming transforming it. Also, you make uh, you train the network to be able to represent, uh, I mean, to detect the objects in different angles in different scales. So you make the training more robust for the network. Uh, there's a few references of using the data augmentation uh, in this video uh, at the bottom, in the description of the video, this, you can find them. Okay, uh, another property of convolution networks is that they support dynamic matrices, uh, while matrix, general matrix multiplication depends on the fixed size uh, matrices. Convolution layers are usually accompanied uh, by a pooling layers and also by 
uh, rectify linear units, relus, uh, that could be seen as a detector layer. So in here you see the three of them, and usually in a normal network you see these patterns repeated over and over and over and over again. And you can, as the picture shows, uh, you can see the convolution layer as uh, the group of the three of them, uh, or separately. And uh, the, the convolution can be seen like, uh, the regular convolution can be seen as detection of local features like edges, and pooling can uh, be seen as detecting patterns within, between patterns. It takes it can take, for example, the maximum of the, of the values of the units of the previous layer. It's like a summary and this helps to detect uh, global features pattern between patterns and uh, in a maximum is the max pooling is the most common but also you can do other operations like taking the average weighted average based on the distance of the central pixel taking the square norm and also one of the properties of pooling is that it's insensitive variant to small translations in the input this property of being sensitive to small translation is useful in computer vision and and the property the, the pooling pooling itself can be seen as an infinitely strong prior. We're going to talk more about this concept of prior later. And that uh, it is good to make your model more effective, even if the assumption is correct. Otherwise, if your assumption is not correct, it's going to underfit. It's not going to predict well. And also in this picture in the right, you can see the prop uh, why. Uh, get an idea of why this pooling is insensitive to small translation. Let's say that you have a this input vector and this is the pool. And in here, uh, this is the max pooling. So the maximum value of here is 1, maximum value of here is 1, maximum value here is 0.2. Uh, but if you translate 1 to the right, uh, like this, 0.2 goes here, 1 goes here, 0.1 here or here, then uh, the maximum of this one is 1. Maximum of this is one. This maximum is one. The one in the borders always have problems, but if you have a, this is very large, the middles are gonna stay the same, and you can see that the middle stay the same. So that's the small translation invariance. Okay, here's a, an illustration of a what a another a, a thing that pooling can be useful for. A, for example, let's say that you have a various units that detect a, a digit in different angles. And this is a max pooling. It's going to take the maximum of the tree. So in here, it resonates with this one. So this one is going to be 1 activated, and this one is not, it's, are going to be 0. So the maximum is 1. And then you feed another digit with another angle. So now these are, are 0. 0, and this is 1. It, it resonates. So the maximum is 1. So it's going to get uh, the same response between the two. So effectively, uh, this is making uh, the pooling, max pooling is making the convolutional layer uh, equivalent, uh, having the equi equivalence uh, in rotation. So it's resistant to, to rotation. And the same can apply to scaling. As mentioned before, the convolution is uh, resistant to translation, but not for rotation or scaling. So the convolution, uh, the, convo uh, the convolution combined with pooling make, make it, uh, the convolution network uh, resistant to a fine transformation, which is very important for detecting objects. Okay, in here uh, we can see a problem that pooling has. Uh, that uh, basically, since you're taking the summary and uh, you are reducing the size of the image, in here we have a, a pooling of width of three, and the the stride is going to be a stride of uh, of two. This is different from what we saw before. Uh, like in here, that the the width was three because you are taking three neighbors. But the stride it was one, so uh, we take the value here, jump to the next one, and take three, and jump to the next one with three, and in this case you can see that the output is the same size as the input. But if you use a stride of a uh, of two, uh, okay, we get the three here, then jump two, take three, jump two, take three. Uh, in here, uh, this re uh, reduces the uh, uh, the computational requirement, the memory requirement, but also reduces the size of the image. And we're going to see in a moment why that is a problem. Uh, that, that is a problem. Uh, I mean, the reduction of the image is a problem in problems like segmentation uh, or, let's say, uh, noise removal, where you want to keep the, the output of the image, si the output image size the same as the input. 
but many uses of convolutional networks are for classification. Like in this problem, for example, this is similar to what you see in the Google Net in MATLAB Deep Learning Toolbox, that uh, you have a pre-trained neural network that takes an image as an input and classifies hundreds of thousand, a thousand categories. So the, of course, uh, this uh, cartoon uh, representation mod, uh, here, there's there's no branching, there's very few layers, but it's for just for illustration. And you have three of them. Okay, so all of them has input image with three color channels, red, green, blue, and then apply the convolution, pooling, and again, convolution, there's no ReLU, but it should be ReLU. Yeah, there's conv convolution plus ReLU. Yeah, they put them together. And you can see that the convolution, uh, most likely is using padding of some sort. Uh, it keeps the image the same way, but because of the weights of convolution, you change one dimension from the color domain, the feature of colors, to the output features, which is 64. And then you apply pooling, and it's a stride of four, so it's going to divide by four the dimensions of the images. And then uh, eventually you want category, so you don't care about the reducing the size of the image, but you can see that it's reducing it. And then apply convolution again, keeps the same size, and keeps up pulling. Now it's been smaller. But now finally, uh, after all of these early detection, is this similar to what you see in image processing transformations, that you detect the, the features. Now you want to do the classification, and for that you don't care about having a, a matrix shape. So you're going to flatten the array. And then with that, now you're going to use a, you can use a fully matrix, uh, with a generic matrix multiplication, fully connected layer to do and a softmax to the classification. And th this is the same thing, but uh, there's some, the pooling here is using a little bit different pooling tree by tree. And also the last one shows that you don't have to record to a fully connected layer or a flattening to get the classifications. You can go all the way with convolution. The author it talks about the strong uh, the prior concept and he said that the convolution and pooling can be seen as an infinitely strong prior. A prior uh, can be seen as a constraint or assumption on the model. Uh, so, for example, if you believe that the model should behave a certain way, you impose uh, that prior into the model, and by doing that, it's like pruning uh, the model. So it, you can make it more uh, uh, efficient. Uh, by pruning it with this uh, prior. And if the assumption is correct, then it's going to model well, very well. But if the assumption is wrong, then it's, it can underfit and it will not predict well. And uh, also, there are some priors that could be strong. Uh, for example, he mentioned the example of Gaussian uh, distribution with low variance, and that is more steady. So it's going to uh, give less flexibility for changing the parameters in the model. Uh, or a Gaussian distribution with high variance, uh, that is a more, uh, it lets the parameters uh, be, uh, there's more flexibility in the changing of parameters. So for the convolution and, and, and pooling properties, that they have this equivalent, uh, for example, convolution has the equivalent in, equivalent in translation in, if the pooling is invariant to small translation, convolution is local, it have the same values in all the kernels. This can be seen as a strong, a, a infinite strong priors. A, and if it applies to the problem, they can be very effective. But if it doesn't, for example, let's say that you want to detect uh, the relative position of a eye a, 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 between the eye and a mouth for detecting a face. Then the the, uh, the prior of uh, pure locality of sharing all the parameters in the convolution, then that assumption is wrong for that case, and it's not gonna it's gonna underfit. As mentioned before, uh, the in order for the priors to be effective, the assumption has to be accurate, and there are cases in which uh, the assumption uh, the assumption holds for some channels for some dimensions, but not for others. So you can do the pooling uh, and convolution in certain channels, but not in other. Okay, so now we're going to talk about some va variants of the basic convolution function. Uh, so far, we have talked about that the kernel is the same throughout the whole image. And this is good for some cases, but for some cases, you want to have different values uh, for 
the connections across the image uh, as the, the case for the relative distance between the eye and the mouth. And usually when you detect an object, there's a combination of both. That's why you have multiple layers. Some of the layers uh, could share the parameters completely and others could have something in between the fully connected layer and the and some is there there's some in between that we're going to talk in a moment so this is one of them so in here you can see that the kernel is not mn always so you have this i dimension that is in the output but not in the input and you have this l dimension that is in the input but not in the output so you for each combination of input and output for these dimensions or channels you're going to have a different kernel so it's not the same okay Another strategy for reducing the computational cost of a, of convolution is striding the convolution, and you can see here the stride is uh, multiplying the is jumping throughout the dimension values in the input image. So you can see it uh, as here uh, you have a regular convolution, uh, and but then if this convolution is has a stride of two, so I compute the value here, jump one, two, go to the next, and here it's just compute the values here, jump one. To jump another one. So, uh, I and Goodfellow mentioned that there are some networks now that do not use pooling, that instead uses use stride, stride convolution uh, instead of the pooling. It seems to be doing something similar. Uh, I guess uh, you can have layers that uh, mix stride convolution with uh, unitary stride conv regular convolution. And in the cases where you're doing classification, uh, uh, and in the case of the segmentation also, uh, you have to do some downsampling uh, of the image down to the fissure. You want to go down to the fissure, so this is a way of downsampling, as you can see in here. An important concept in pooling is, uh, sorry, in convolution is padding. Uh, as mentioned before, if you have, if you iterate the window through only the valid values of the images, you're going to lose the border, and the, the amount of border that you lose is proportional to the size of the kernel. For example, let's say you have a kernel size of, it looks like a five, a dimension of a width of five. Uh, so in here, uh, for each, uh, in this one, uh, for each uh, layer, you're going to see five divided by two, a uh, floor, uh, which is two. So you're going to see two pixels being lost, or more, I think. And you're gonna see pixels lost, and networks are very deep. So if you have hundreds of layers, then eventually uh, this is gonna erode uh, your image. And there are problems like, uh, for example, uh, removing noise from an image, or the segmentation for automate uh, 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 autom uh, drivers assistant, uh, automatic driver assistance. You can see examples of those in the in the links reference links of this video. Uh, in those examples, uh, you want the output image to be the same size. So if you do convolution in a very deep uh, network, uh, you're going to lose the image and you don't want that. So you want to keep the output image in convolution of the same size. And for that, uh, you use padding. So one of the strategies, as we're going to see in more detail later, is to add padding the same size of what you lose, exactly of what you lose in the, in the kernel window. So in this, you can see that the Im uh, image remains uh, the same size. Okay, the, uh, the author mentions three types of convolution, valid, same, and full. We're going to talk about the three of them. And this matches the same configuration that you get in the GPU coder uh, stencil kernel function. Uh, you have a, there's a reference in, in this video to that, both the valid documentation and also a video uh, showing how to use it. And... Uh, this function fits perfectly uh, into a convolution pattern, as mentioned before. It separates KU from algorithm, which allows total freedom to the GPU core to parallelize this uh, heavily in the GPU in your GPU, and also it help it could have also parallelizing with other targets. And the the kernel is basically taking a callback function, and the callback function is implementing the inner. Uh, if you remember the the convolution formula is a uh, two summations and you have the multiplication inside the summation. The, the summation is the schedule. Those are the nested for loops. So, so the nested for loops are taken away. So the nested for loops are part of the implementation of this. And the inner computation is what you define in the funk here. And A is the input image and B is the output image. 
So this is going to implement the convolution operation, but it also can implement other image processing. Uh, Uh, yeah. Oops. Uh, the shape argument is the the one that uh, that determines if your value it has the options of valid, same, and full. Okay. So let's go through the three of them. Uh, valid means that there's no pad, no pad. So the windows have to go through all the only the valid pixels. So the output, as we saw before, the output image is going to reduce in the size. A, in size proportional to the size of the kernel, which is n by n. So you subtract the dimensions here. Okay, but the, again, that is bad. So we have the option of uh, the middle ground, uh, which is uh, the same option. And in the same option, the b is the same size of, as a. So there's going to be enough zero padding to make uh, the output the output equal to there's the, it's going to be enough zero, uh, zero padding in the input so that the output could be the same size uh, as the input. But uh, this could be problematic in the borders. Uh, they can be somewhat underrepresented. So this motivates the option of full. And the full is going to uh, expand uh, the, the input as large as the kernel size. And yeah, uh, so basically you can see the output being uh, Instead of subtracting, it's going to add the sizes of the kernel, so it's going to be larger. But uh, in practice, it has been seen that for convolution, valid and same options are the most uh, efficient. Okay, uh, one of the again one of the basic features of convolution is uh, having the same uh, values for the kernel window across the whole image. Uh, that is one extreme, uh, and we and we can see it in here uh, that. In convolution, you have a b for each neighbor processing operation, and for the other extreme is having the general matrix multiplication in which everything depends on everything and each connection has a different value. But uh, there's an in between. You can have convolution uh, with uh, a different value for each connection. So you can see a b c d e f g h i. So everything is different, and we saw. Uh, in a previous slide that the kernel window could be different between two channels, two combination of channels between input and output, that doesn't uh, even in, be in, between, in between these two. And we're going to see more about that. Uh, but uh, in this one, everything is different. You have uh, three dimensions, L, J, and K, and you can see them here, L, J, and K. And the output has three dimensions, I, J, and K, I, J, and K. Only on the shared dimensions, J and K, J and K, J and K in the shared dimensions between the input and the output, that's where the kernel is applied. And so you're going to get a different MN matrix for each combination of dimensions. So effectively, from convolution, this option gives you a, a different values for each connection, which is good for things that, like detecting a mouse in a face. A, a mouse within a face of an image, and again, you can combine these layers, layers like this one, where uh, the ways are different uh, for each position to detect things that are relative to position, and you can have also earlier st stages, uh, convolution layers where you have it like this, where the parameters are the same for to detect edges or doing transformations to the image, equivalent uh, transformations. Of course, uh, this comes uh, at the expense of, of memory. Okay, so here's another uh, type of uh, variant in convolution. You can restrict the convolution to certain channels, as mentioned before. If the the prior the assumptions for the prior convolution applies to certain channels, then you can constrain it uh, like it is shown in, in here. Okay, so there's another in between from what we saw. Uh, we have the regular convolution with all parameters are shared. We have the the unshared convolution, which you have different uh, values of weights for each connection. But you can have also have it in the middle, which is tile, and you can use use a modulus in the kernel dimensions to repeat over and over and over again. So it's like an in between. I guess this should have some application uh, utilities. Okay. So you have A, B, C, D, and then you go back to A, B, C, D, so you repeat it. So this requires less memory as this one, as you can imagine. 
Okay, I'm not going to go in details of this. Uh, you can pause uh, to read or read directly in the book. But the important thing is that this seems to be conveying is that uh, so far we have talked about sharing weights uh, in convolution, uh, sharing or not sharing them. So, but he's basically saying that uh, we also have bias. Bias and weights are part of the training parameters of our neural network. And he's suggesting that uh, both things should be treated similarly. And separating the bias uh, might slightly affect the statistical efficiency of them all, so you want to keep them together. Uh, but uh, there are some exceptions, for example, in the borders that uh, the bias, uh, you might want to hack the biases to correct issues at the border. Uh, most of the examples that we have seen so far is where the convolution output is classification. That is a very common case uh, that you want to classify, detect objects and things like that. But also uh, there are cases where the output is an image. For example, if you want to have a noise removal, here you can train the convolution network to remove this noise. And there's an example for that. Uh, you can see the how this is used. Uh, how this is done with the MATLAB deep learning image processing toolbox in the reference of this video. And also there's a sample of segmentation for automated driver's assistance. Uh, there's another reference of using the deep learning toolbox of how to do this example as well. And in this case, uh, the classification is done at the pixel level. So each pixel contains one category. In this case, we might have like 10 categories, uh, like buildings, uh, uh, driveway, uh, pedestrian, uh, trees, sky. And so in both cases, you want the output image to be the same size as, as the input. And, but it, convolution networks uh, that do this uh, have pooling. And the pooling has the problem that uh, it reduces uh, the image size. So the author is uh, suggesting to, to avoid this, uh, to avoid this problem in these cases, to avoid pooling uh, has a pooling of Unistride, uh, which, uh, and also to have a uh, I'll put a low resolution image, which is not an option in these cases. Uh, but the author doesn't mention an option that uh, is using the MATLAB deep learning toolbox, which is using a, a transpose uh, convolution. So, what, for example, in the case of uh, segmentation, uh, you have a, a, a phase of encoding in which the image is reduced uh, through a set of convolution, regular convolution and pooling. And, and you augment the features, get more and more features, but reduce the image size. And then you go through an upsampling decoding phase in which you use transpose convolution to increase the size, and eventually you got this. And it's important that the output image is the same size because once you have the segmentation, you're only going to get colors in the output. So you want to uh, apply this, that mask on the original input image so that you can get additional properties of the objects uh, that you're detecting. Okay, so here's an example, a convolutional network from one of the videos in the references below. And we're only showing the lower part. And you can see that uh, we're going to see a set of convolutions, uh, redus, and uh, the, the pooling is not shown, but it should be up there. And there's a lot of branching. So far, what we have seen is a, a sequential, but you can see that branching is important. But the point is that uh, after you apply the encoding phase of going from a convolution, a relu, uh, the, the pooling is going to bring down the image size uh, to this uh, to this small size, but you augment the number of features up to a uh, maximum point. And then you go uh, to the decoding phase. Eventually, the output is going to be pixel classification. Uh, this is for segmentation. You softmax, and you can see that the output image is, is the same as of, of the input. It should be the same. And you can see also the training uh, parameters are weights and biases, as we discussed before. So in order to upsample, to bring the image back to its original size, uh, you use uh, the transpose convolution. So here you see the first one, it auments the image size, and then you see the other one that brings it up to the output size. The author also talks about a additional types of arrays that can be expected in convolutional networks. As mentioned before, convolutional networks are good for grid-like arrays, contiguous arrays. Uh, images is a classic example, a 2D matrix. When you have colors, now you have a tensor with a channel or an hyperspectral image. Uh, and then you put the time dimension, then you have now a four-dimensional tensor. 
And if you add volume, then you can never have a five dimension if you have a volumetric images uh, animation with colors. Uh, so uh, here's an example. Uh, you can see in the reference links below an example of how to detect tumors uh, in MRI images using the MATLAB deep learning toolbox. Uh, so in that case, you have a volumetric tensor. Uh, or is, it can be also a CT scan. As mentioned before, parallelization in the computation of convolutional network is essential. It, it things like a GPU coherence testing kernel and it can help with that, as mentioned before. It, there's a lot of research in how to uh, improve the computation of the convolution operation. And one of the details that the author mentions is that uh, if your kernel is se separable, then it is better to uh, express the, the weight as a outer product of vectors and that can change the runtime from exponential to linear. Okay, as you may know, uh, in convolution and deep learning uh, train uh, in general, the, the most of the time of execution goes in training. Uh, once the network is trained, uh, it, it is computationally expensive, uh, but it could take maybe minutes or seconds to uh, predict the value, but uh, for training, it can take hours or days uh, to, to train the network. So, uh, again, there's research uh, how to improve this, and the author mentions some of it. Uh, and he mentions that uh, training the, the output layer is usually uh, less expensive because, if, especially in classification problems, that the, the size of the image gets eroded, perhaps it's because of that. Uh, one of the things that uh, he mentions is that uh, basically train all the networks using unsupervised training and then uh, train the last one with supervised uh, fashion. Uh, in general, basically not uh, not training everything with su uh, supervised fashion, uh, which is expensive. So also mentions that uh, random initialization is effective. Uh, again, uh, uh, in the previous chapters in the book, we see that uh, Initialization is very important because a bad initialization uh, could basically lead to a slower training times is, uh, and it might not even converge at all if it is badly initialized. And it's mentioning over and over again that random initialization of weights uh, is effective. Okay, uh, one of the techniques is uh, unconditional train everything but the last layer. And the last layer could be seen as a convex optimization problem, which maybe could be trained uh, supervised. And this is similar to the transfer uh, learning technique. Uh, there's a reference uh, in this video uh, about how to do the transfer learning with uh, the deep learning tool of MATLAB, in which we take uh, a pre train in a neural network like SwissNet, GoogleNet, and a it's already trained and is class ready to classify thousands of objects. Uh, I mean, thousand categories of objects. Or let's say that we want to uh, detect five types of objects. Uh, then what we do is uh, replace the last fully connected layer by a new layer that outputs five categories, and then only train uh, train the network again. But either not train the first layers or put a very low rate of training and put a high a, a learning rate to the last layer that we just replaced. And then it will auto, would automatically detect, uh, it will effectively connect, uh, detect the, the new five categories for which we train it for. Uh, another strategy that he mentions is that, okay, if you want to evaluate different uh, network architectures, you might only train uh, the last layer and evaluate the different architectures. And when you select the best, then train the whole network. Okay, uh, also the author mentions uh, some other strategy about uh, training in which you train one layer in isolation, then train the next layer in isolation, and, and so on. Uh, but finally, he makes a comment that today, most convolutional networks are trained in a purely supervised fashion using full forward and back propagation through the entire network on each training iteration. That is funny. So basically, there's no, all these uh, games to avoid training everything supervised fashion, but He's saying that now everything is supervised anyway. The convolution networks uh, have been one of the greatest success story of biologically inspired artificial intelligence. Uh, it was heavily inspired by the neuroscience of the mammalian vision system, 
it is uh, uh, one of the publications, uh, most influential pro uh, publications about the understanding of the mammalian vision system. So, but it's not uh, completely, as we're going to see later, especially in training, it was not completely influenced by biology, just uh, partially, but significantly. Uh, deep learning can be seen, uh, deep learning to brains can be seen as uh, airplanes to, to birds. If aerospace engineers uh, would have uh, decided to try to mimic as much as possible a bird when designing a plane, probably we will not be flying planes today. Uh, they only mimic the bird partially and then uh, optimize its, fun uh, his, its functionality using uh, mathematical and physics uh, principles. And now the, the planes are able to fly higher than the birds, but they are not the same like birds. Also, we have the case of uh, robots. Let's say that you want to do some chores in the house and you are not going to make a C-3PO uh, or an Android to, to do a humanoid Android to, to do all those type of things. You're going to assign a specific, a robots specifically for that task and they're not going to be like humans, but they might perform tasks better than humans because they were optimized toward that task. And the same philosophy goes in deep learning and convolutional networks that they are inspired partially by the brain, but they're not trying to mimic a, bra a brain. They don't replace the brain, but they are optimized with mathematical concepts to perform certain tasks better than brains do, but they're not brains and then do not do everything that the brain does. Okay, so let's talk about the similarities between the convolution networks and the mammalian vision system. And the V1 layer in the brain a neural network is the one of the most similar. It, it does some pre-processing, some image processing like operation like edge detection and uh, handling uh, with contrast, uh, things like that, I suppose. And the V1 layer in the brain is arranged in a spatial map. It actually has two dimensional structure. It contains uh, simple cells uh, that are linear functions that uh, are localized and they are more similar to detector units in CNS, but also has uh, the complex cells, uh, which are invariant to small shifts. That sounds familiar. Uh, so they can be seen as the pulling units, and there are some uh, cross channel pullings, uh, some other that are similar to the max out units. Also, the author talks about the, the grandmother cells, uh, which looks like uh, look like classification uh, layers. And like the Halle, Halle Berry a neuron, which looks like a classification a, a layer, because a, that neuron that they found, a, it only activates when a particular, a, when you see a, a, a picture of a particular individual or read the name or hear the name, that neuron gets activated. So it's like a classification a, a neur, neuron or layer. Another uh, layer uh, that was found in the brain was called info inferotemporal cortex IP, and that's closest to the back end. And you can see the chain in here. You go from the I retina to the LGN to the V1 to the V2 to the V4, and then to the IT, everything within 100 milliseconds. Okay, uh, so these are, this looks like it's the most similar one uh, to the convolution network. So if a person, uh, he mentions uh, that, the author mentions that if a person keeps looking at the object, the, the networks, I mean the neurons, uh, start to update. It's like as you watch something, you, you are training your brain. The more you watch something, the more it, it is being trained. Uh, it's like uh, when you stick your, your eyes to something for a long time, focus on it, and you close your eyes, you're not going to keep seeing that thing in, in a even with eye clothes. I think that's what he's uh, referring to. Okay, let's talk about the difference now. Uh, the human eye is mostly low resolution, but it has a, like a focus mechanism that gives the illusion of a high resolution. The, the visual system is, the human visual system is integrated with many other senses, such as hearing, uh, and they are connected to moods and thoughts. The, the human vision system uh, does much more than recognize objects. Uh, it also understand whole scenes, the relationship between objects, 3D geometric information to, uh, to walk through the environment, 
but uh, convolution neural networks are getting better in these tasks. Uh, also, uh, there's a lot of uh, feedback from the higher la layers in, in brain networks, but I think this is what happened in the convolutional neural network that we just saw, that, that there's some branching, perhaps maybe referring to the same thing. And also the, the neurons in the brain, like simple and complex neurons, cells, might be re really different to the units that we see in a CNN. As mentioned before, uh, the convolutional networks were inspired heavily by the brain mammalian vision system, but uh, not everything was uh, taken from it, especially in the training, because uh, Autor mentions that neuroscience uh, didn't affect, didn't influence much in the training mechanisms of convolutional layers with use back propagation, gradient descent algorithms, and things like that. So this is one of the papers that influenced most the, the training uh, algorithms. It was applied to one dimension that was expanded to two dimensions, and it worked. Okay, let's talk about the, the simple cells. Uh, simple cells are uh, roughly linear uh, and selective uh, features. Uh, complex are nonlinear and uh, are invariant and more invariant. Uh, so yeah, uh, the, the simple cells maybe can be seen as convolution and the complex cells can be seen as pooling as mentioned before. So they are stacked together and alternating like we see in the convolutional networks. And so you're alternating between selectivity and invariance and that yields the grandmother cells. Uh, author, the author mentioned also that simplex and complex cells could be the same neurons, the same cells, but with different configuration parameters. And as in the case of convolution networks, uh, when you see a convolution network, the input is the image and the output is classification, let's say in a classification problem. So you expect that the, input, the output of uh, the first layers to be closer to the, to the image and the outputs of the backend layers to be closer to the classification. So that's why since the frontend layers are closer to the image, uh, you can take the output and visualize it easier because they are closer to the image. But if you try to visualize the output of the convolution network, since they are uh, closer to the classification, it's going to become unrecognizable at some point. So uh, there, there are two references uh, at the below uh, of how to use Keras for visualizing these initial layers of a convolution network. And also there's another reference to how to visualize the same layers uh, using the MATLAB Deep Learning Toolbox. The author mentioned that some of the experiments that were used to get information on the, about the brain mammalian system, and one of them was a, a basically piercing the brain of a poor a mice, mouse a, to detect the, the electric impulse of the brain. And basically they were able to infer a, that the, the visual system a, behaved like a GABOR, a, like a GABOR function. And you can see the GABOR function in here uh, that looks like an edge detection. It's like an edge detection in different angles and different, so it's kind of invariant to rotation and translation. And uh, you can infer also uh, using formulas like this, uh, the two-dimensional properties. Uh, th this looks to me abusive, and hopefully there are some animal rights agency trying to avoid this as much as possible. And also you can see in the reference, uh, the IM Gabor filter from the image processing toolbox to see how this behaves. This is horrible. Mm -hmm. uh, to conclude, uh, again, uh, convolutional networks uh, are one of the best examples of biologically inspired uh, driven technology uh, that was inspired by the brain mammalian vision system and was one of the first deep learning models to perform well, and also one of the first to have a commercial applications like the AT&T check reader in the 90s. Uh, also the convolutional networks uh, were some of the first working deep networks uh, with backpropagation algorithm for training, perhaps because of its efficiency. And also again, the convolutional networks are good for a data that has grid-like uh, structure, uh, contiguous arrays, basically uh, matrices, tensors, if you're dealing with a 1D sequential uh, time-wise data, like text, text processing, 
uh, recurrent neural networks uh, work better and that's the topic of the next chapter. Thank you for your attention.